Hello everyone. This is Dr. Stevens and this is a lecture on speaker and situation for unit three of literary genres and we will be discussing this uh, in the uh, unit forum, the discussion forum for this unit and I believe it will be uh, thread three in that forum. So this lecture then goes along uh, with that discussion thread. So we're going to be talking about speaker and situation and what does this mean? We're talking about who is the speaker and what are the circumstances in which he or she is speaking. Now, when I first started studying poetry uh, in college, some years ago now, um, we referred to this as the dramatic situation, picturing um, the speaker in a situation that's like a drama. That is, it's, it's alive. It's not simply on the page, but as if you could picture somebody standing there talking in some particular set of circumstances. Um, now, in the Norton Introduction to Literature, and that's what NIL refers to, uh, in the Norton Introduction to Literature, whoops, didn't mean to do that, uh, you can find a lot of this information in chapters 8 and chapters 9. I'd like to begin with one way in which we can define the speaker in a lyric poem. And this comes from uh, the Norton, page 496, poems. Poems come to us as the expression of an individual human voice. All right, what we do is we hear an individual no matter what kind of individual it is, and we'll be going over that, um, but whoever it is, it's an individual speaking. Now, it could be somebody speaking all by himself. It could be somebody speaking to somebody else. But what we do is we hear the individual voice. And this, all right, is one of the things that distinguish distinguishes lyric poetry from those other two genres, narrative and drama. Remember we talked about these genres in Unit 2, and there are three main categories of literature in your textbook, Norton Introduction. Uh, they're referred to as poetry fiction, and drama, and as I explained, I like to use the older term narrative instead of fiction, but uh, it should be pretty clear what we're talking about here. All right, and this is one of the main things, the definitive things that distinguishes lyric poetry from narrative and drama, and that is the speaker. The speaker in a lyric poem is fundamentally different from the speakers in narrative and drama in that it is an individual human voice talking about something of concern to it. It's not a narrative voice because a narrative voice is telling us a story. All right. But this is an individual human voice. The expression of that voice talking about a particular subject, usually a single subject of concern to that speaker. But, all right, but then whose voice is it, we say? It is one, not necessarily the voice of the poet himself or herself. But at the same time, this doesn't mean that it is a distinct character clearly separate from the poem and you'll see poet and you'll see what we mean by that as we go along so in the reading assigned for uh, this unit uh, I'm giving you some examples of poems in this category and the uh, 
Uh, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, which we've already looked at. The Sun Rising by John Donne. The poem Sonnet by Billy Collins. These are all uh, in your reading list. And so these are some examples of poem poems in which the speaker is not necessarily the poet, but still is not a clear separate character. Okay, and we'll see what we mean by that when we get to number two here. The speaker could be a distinct character created by the poet, but clearly not the poet. And in this particular case, this example of the pool players, it wouldn't be just one character, it would be a group of characters, the pool players, and we'll look at that poem uh, in a minute. The third category is the speaker is the poet herself or himself. Now this is this is fairly complicated because we still make a distinction even when we're reading a poem that is clearly autobiographical. Okay? We still make a distinction between the poet and the speaker, the poet as the speaker in the poem. In other words, what we see in the poem is not necessarily the poet himself. Now, I don't want to, I know that, I realize that sounds confusing, um, but we'll, 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 we'll uh, talk about that when we get to uh, this poem by John Milton, When I Consider How My Light Is Spent. Another example uh, is Seamus Heaney's poem, Midterm Break. We're not looking at that poem in this lecture, but in that poem, Seamus Heaney, the, the great Irish poet who actually died uh, last week, um, uh, talks about an incident uh, which actually is an incident in Seamus Heaney's own life, and it has to do with the funeral of his four-year-old brother who was struck by a car and killed. Now, we happen to know that that actually happened in Seamus Heaney's life, life, and so certainly we can say, well, that voice that we hear in that poem, that's the voice of Seamus Heaney. And likewise, with when I consider how my light is spent, we say, well, that is about, it's by John Milton, and it's about John Milton himself, because we know that Milton went blind in the middle of his life, and so it is about his blindness. And sometimes, by the way, that poem, that sonnet, is called On His Blindness. Milton writing about what it is like to be blind. All right, so the speaker, three kinds of speaker, and we'll look at that. And then also the situation, or the dramatic situation. And that is simply the circumstances. Where is this speaker speaking? When? Okay. To whom? And remember, the speaker is not necessarily talking to anybody in particular. The speaker could simply be talking to himself. Uh, and what is the occasion? Meaning, what is it that has prompted this individual to be speaking the words that he or she speaks? Let's look at that first case. The poem in which it might sound as though it's the poet speaking, but not necessarily, okay? And by the way, remember this fundamental um, definitive characteristic of the speaker in a lyric poem, right? The speaker sounds, makes the poem sound as if it were coming to us as the expression of the individual human voice distinguishing lyric poetry from those other two major genres. Okay, so we're looking at speakers then. All right, now, in the first case, we say it's not necessarily the poet, but it isn't necessarily not the poet either. Okay, 
the discrepancy, Norton introduction tells you the discrepancy between the speaker and the poet may be uncertain. So stopping by woods on a snowy evening then. Um, and you know this poem, so I don't need to read the whole thing, but let, let's just look at or listen to the sound of this voice. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the coldest evening, or the darkest evening, I'm sorry, the darkest evening of the year. All right, a voice. Clearly a distinct individual voice, all right? This is not um, a narrator telling us a story about uh, some kind of complex series of events that involves many different characters, all right? It's an individual talking about one particular experience. It's not the voice of somebody in a drama, one of several, perhaps many characters uh, in a play who we hear talking on the stage like Polonius and Hamlet in that selection that we looked at in unit two. No, this is the individual voice. And what we try to do then is we try to describe the characteristics of this voice. And so what is it? Well, we say, well, let, let's look at the situation. Whose woods these are? Now, this poem gives us a very clear sense of the where, doesn't it? Okay. Remember, that's one characteristic of the situation is to identify where the speaking is taking place. So it's in the woods. All right. When? Well, we know, first of all, snow. So it's late fall, winter. All right. Approximately. So we get at least some sense of the season of the year. And we also know what time of day. Right. The darkest evening of the year so we know that this individual is in the woods um, late fall winter time at the end of the day and so he's talking then about his experience and he's sharing his thoughts now who is he sharing his thoughts with okay well We've got some sense of the where, right? And we've got some sense of the when. To whom? Well, doesn't seem as though this particular individual is talking to anybody, not even the horse, right? Now, he's thinking about the horse, but he doesn't seem to be talking to the horse, although the horse seems to be talking to the speaker, right? Because the horse... The horse is shaking his his harness bells, right? Okay, he gives the harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The horse is wondering, what the heck are we doing here stopping in these woods when we're really on our way home? And I should be in the barn by now having my evening meal, right? Okay, but anyway, so we pay attention to this because this can be important for our understanding of the deeper meaning of the poem. Who is the poet talking to? Well, I think it's reasonable to suggest that in this, and I said poet, didn't I? Who is the speaker? <laughs> Who is the speaker talking to? And I think it's reasonable to suggest that these are the speaker's own thoughts. In other words, he is talking to himself. Now, uh, he may... Um, he may not be talking out loud necessarily, but he could be saying these words in his head. Uh, let's move on here to the second case, and that is the case of a distinct character. 
And your Norton introduction points out that poets sometimes create characters just as writers of drama and fiction do. And that's on page 496 of your textbook. Here is a poem that also is in your assigned reading for this unit by the poet Gwendolyn Brooks called We Real Cool. And look at what she does. Right at the beginning of the poem, she tells us who the speakers are and where they are. All right. They are the pool players, seven of them at the Golden Shovel or right? whatever the Golden Shovel is. Well, if they're pool players, they're at a pool hall or they're at some kind of club or or tavern or bar where you can play pool, right? So that locates uh, the where, doesn't it? And it also tells us something about the who. So the poem, short poem, and I invite you to uh, read it to yourself. Think about it. Uh, short poem, four little stanzas here. We real cool. We left school. We lurk late. We strike straight. We sing sin. We thin gin. We jazz June. We die soon. All right. A lot we could say about that little poem. It's a wonderful poem. And ironic and very wry and gives us a very, very distinct portrait of some young guys, pool players and so on. But point here is simply who is the speaker or in this case, who are the speakers and Main point is, it's not Gwendolyn Brooks, all right? Gwendolyn Brooks was a respectable woman, a poet. Um, apparently, from the little I know of her life, she did go to bars and taverns with her friends, all right? So she certainly would have seen pool players um, at work, enjoying themselves at the, at the pool table and so on, but not Gwendolyn Brooks herself. So distinct characters created by the poet but um, not the voice of the poet. And the third case that we're looking at, folks, is the poet himself. And the Norton introduction tells you something I think very important here, which is that even when the poets present themselves as if they were speaking directly to us in their own voices, that is, the voice of the poet, Robert Frost, or in this case, John Milton. Their poems present only a partial portrait. You should still think of the speaker instead of the poet. The important thing here is that you don't want to take what you know of the character of the poet as an individual separate from the poem and read that into the poem. You need to be very careful about that because if you do, if you start taking biographical details of the kind of person the poet is and read that into the kind of person the speaker is, you may miss something important about the character of the speaker as represented in the poem itself. All right? So, when I consider how my light is spent by John Milton, great uh, 17th century English poet and the author of one of the greatest verse narratives, epic poems in any language uh, in the English language written at mid to late 17th century, 1600s in England. Okay, so Milton writes, when I consider how my light is spent ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, Lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker and present my true account, lest he returning chide, doth God exact day labor light denied, I fondly ask. But patience, 
to prevent that murmur soon replies god doth not need either man's work or his own gifts who best bear his mild yoke they serve him best his state is kingly thousands at his bidding speed and post o'er land and ocean without rest they also serve who only stand and wait all right a um, complex poem in large part because of the complexity of the syntax i'm not going to try to paraphrase this poem for you right now that's not the purpose of this particular lecture um, when you do the paraphrasing exercise by the way i do invite you to paraphrase the first sentence of this poem and let me point that out to you the first sentence is fairly long when i consider how my light is spent is the beginning of the sentence um, and the end of the sentence is i find fondly ask so um, to paraphrase the the overall structure the main clause of the sentence it goes simply when i consider how my light is spent i fondly ask whether god exacts day labor that's based the basic sentence but my light here's here's your clue to the identity of the speaker as the poet my light is a metaphor for sight and that's not an uncommon metaphor you can certainly see the connection between light and sight because when we go blind or even simply when we close our eyes the light is gone isn't it so that little detail tells us that milton is writing thoughts about his blindness so we say yep of uh, the speaker here certainly is Milton but at the same time as I'm warning you and as the Norton anthology of the Norton introduction to literature is warning you still think of the speaker instead of the poet because what you want to do what you want to do is to make sure that you are looking at the character of the speaker himself or in other cases or obviously herself you want to look at who or what that speaker is as portrayed in the poem so all right let's let me go back up here to um okay uh norton I need, to, I need to look this up, folks. The discrepancy between the speaker and the poet may be uncertain. And I think what is meant here, um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, it does use the word discrepancy. In other poems, the discrepancy between the speaker and the poet may be even more uncertain. I, I, I think that might be a little bit more clear if we were to say simply the difference. Um, in other words, the, or you might even say the distance. The distance between the speaker and the poet may be uncertain. All right, so let's close by looking at what I'm talking about uh, as the character of the speaker. Now, we know a lot about the life of Robert Frost. We know that he lived in the countryside on farms in New England. We know that he certainly traveled around um, in the earlier part of the 20th century, he would travel around in, uh, say, wagons or carts, or in the wintertime, even sleighs drawn by horses and so on. So we can say, well, yeah, this certainly could be Robert Frost because he certainly could have stopped in the woods uh, late one evening and so on. 
I guess the point that I'm making and that I believe the Norton introduction is making here, folks, is that what we want to do, whether we identify the speaker with the poet or not, what we really want to do is pay attention to the actual character of the speaker. I know I've said that before. All right, so I won't, I won't repeat that phrase again. Okay, I promise you. But how can we describe this character? That's the important thing. Well, here he is. He's stopping by the woods. All right. We know something of the situation, the dramatic situation in which he is speaking. And what does he do? Does he start out by describing the woods? No. He ends by describing the woods, doesn't he? Right? He says the woods are lovely, dark, and deep. But that's at the end. He begins by talking about the guy who owns the woods. Right? His house is in the village, though. Why would he be saying that? Well, he is conscious of people, isn't he? Uh, we don't know what his exact relationship is with this person. He seems to know who this person is, seems to know something about the village, where the person lives, and that sort of thing. But what we can say about this speaker, um, Forget Robert Frost, right? We're talking about the speaker here. And what we can say about the speaker is, well, he seems to be concerned about um, the person, the people in the village, this particular person, and whether or not he would be seen stopping here. We don't know why he would be self-conscious about this. Is he afraid that the owner might think he was trespassing? Or is he afraid that the owner might think, well, what is he doing stopping there? He really ought to be going home. We don't know exactly what it is. The important thing is that one aspect of this speaker, one characteristic, is that he is aware of others. He is aware of the life of the village, and he is thinking about them. He's not thinking right away about the woods. And that continues in this second stanza, doesn't it? My little horse must think it queer. Why is he worried about the horse? To stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake. Ah, he finally gets around to telling us something about the setting, right? The darkest evening of the year. But again, um, he's conscious of, of the man in the village who owns the woods, and now he's conscious of what his horse might be thinking. Well, we don't know whether the horse literally thinks that it's queer or unusual, right? But that occurs to the speaker. The speaker is conscious of the fact that it might be in some way kind of out of the ordinary, kind of odd for him to be stopping here. And so we think, well, maybe he's just conscious of the fact that he really should be getting home, right? And he seems to think the horse might be thinking that, that it's really, we really should be getting home to the, to somewhere where there's a farmhouse and a barn and some oats for me to eat and that sort of thing, right? My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. So we're getting a sense of the mentality of the speaker, aren't we? The things that he thinks about. He's not thinking about the woods right now. He's thinking about the people in the village. He's thinking about the eye, the, the possibility that, you know, it's kind of strange for him to be stopping here in the first place. And then finally, we get down to the details of the setting itself. The only other sounds, the sweep, right? The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. And now he starts to describe the woods themselves more and more until he gets to this key sentence here, right? The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. He is telling us something about his feelings about the woods, right? He has described them, all right? He has described at least the wind and the snow falling. Um, and now he's telling us that the woods are lovely. So what do we do? We get, we get a sense of what is important to him, right? 
And there are two categories of things that are important to the speaker here. The woods, he is obviously very, very much attracted to the woods, but he is also very, very conscious of home. That comes to us through what he imagines the horse must might be thinking, and of the community, right? What people, this particular person in, in the village might be thinking, what people in the village might be thinking, right? So what am I doing here? I'm not trying to tell you what the poem means so much as trying to give you a sense of how you talk about the nature of the speaker. Okay, and then these famous lines at the end, I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. All right, interpretation. One very, very brief note of interpretation here. Um, one famous interpretation of this poem is that it is about death and the speaker's thoughts about death so that sleep is here a figure of speech or a metaphor for death. And that's, that's not uncommon. Sleep is very often a metaphor uh, for death. I am not telling you that that is necessarily my interpretation. I'm bringing this out simply to distinguish between interpretation. He's literally saying sleep, right? So we're not talking about literal. If we say, oh, he's really talking about death, then we're getting into interpretation. But the important thing for us talking about the speaker is to pay attention to what's on his mind. The guy in the village, the fact of home and that, you know, they've stopped when they really are on their way home. Um, and the fact that he has promises to keep he cannot stop here forever, can he? He can't stop here very long because he has other things to do with his life. All right, folks. So an introduction to the whole concept of speaker and situation and three general different kinds of speakers in a lyric poem. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you online.